Okay, so um, I'm going to talk more from the end user of vocabularies point of view. The last thing I would claim to be is an expert in vocabularies. Um, and you'll probably see why <laughs> as I go through the presentation. But um, we built during the major open data collection project, the ANS project, a data hub of Australian research on marine and aquatic ecocultures. And um, it led us in, down a few different adventures in vocabulary implementation. Uh, part of that was because the archive was conceived as a multidisciplinary data hub and it was themed around water related research. So um, when we talk about ecocultures in the title of the hub, um, it denotes a concept which is central to two of the data collections that we seeded the hub with, both of which dealt with the failure of science-based policy in the face of local implementations. So one of those was a project called Talking Fish, which was investigating the relationship of local stakeholders in the Murray-Darling Basin region. And after a severe drought, the Howard government had legislated the Water Act and that commoditized water. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, a controversial water management regime was put in with mixed environmental, social and economic impacts. And the um, Murray-Darling Basin Authority had been criticized at that time for failing to engage with the communities. And this study was part of the response. So it was actually a social science study, but the participants included um, professional and recreational fishers, indigenous people who lived in that region and had for many thousand years. And um, that's an Aboriginal fish trap you can probably see there. Um, on the right of the screen. Um, also, they interviewed science, scientists and ecologists, and so there was a wider range of disciplinary perspectives in it, um, in the data than simply more kind of social sciences or um, cultural history oriented ones. And then the second collection similarly um, concerned marine parks, and it was a, a scientist here um, Dr. Michelle Boyer, who was um, asking why did evidence-based policy fail um, in the implementation of marine parks when they were essentially based on really solid and sound science. So she was also moving to a social science approach. So I guess both of the projects pointed to the need for a kind of improved connectivity between quite different knowledge domains, science as a way of understanding the natural world, but also social science and cultural history to investigate human practices and where the two interacted. And so we came to the decision to support multidisciplinary data in the hope that we'd be able to bring um, rather chaotically bring science and social science together. Um, one of the first things we looked at was about what was water, and this was before we looked at the data that we had. Um, we were looking for vocabs that would help us to um, index, um, you know, water-related terms. And interestingly, at that time, we found there was not much going on with the harmonisation of water vocabs, but we didn't know that Simon Cox had done quite a lot of work in that area. So that's really great to have seen. And I recommend having a look at what Syro have done in that area. Um, also, many of the vocabularies and we found were actually, you know, may as well have been written in stone tablets. They were on like image documents and things like that. So we were really keen to um, go with something that was accessible um, in a machine to machine sense. Um, and ultimately, when we did look at the data, we realized that, well, water was the theme of the whole archive and but that it wasn't necessarily the subject because actually there were a lot of other subjects that um, came out more strongly although water tied everything to water research tied things together. Um, I think if we'd included or if we do include more scientific data in the archive um, it's quite likely we'll reconsider whether water vocabularies will be relevant um, but at this point the only scientific data really in the archive is um, some species data from ALA and also some terrestrial ecosystems satellite images. So um, we haven't needed to do that yet. So the main vocabulary I was going to focus on in my talk was, was subject. Um, we were looking for vocabularies that were used really widely at collecting institutions, um, available in machine to machine format because we were aiming for a reusable item based collection platform. And that supported Australian terms 
and had coverage of multiple disciplines at the level of an educated public readership. And that was sort of inspired by the ANS Content Providers Guide um, concept about, you know, aiming this towards a reader who had familiarity with the research area, but not necessarily a specialist, because that supports cross-disciplinary use. So um, the winners, <laughs> our decision was to um, actually use both the Library of Congress subject headings and also Schools Online Thesaurus. Yay, Les. <laughs> Um, so why? Well, firstly, the answer of why LCSH is pretty amusingly answered in this Quora item I found, essentially because LCSH are used widely, have change management program in place, um, and as you mentioned several other times in there, it's used widely. Again, it's used widely. And so that idea, you know, I mean, interoperability is obviously a key concept in vocabularies and essentially we used LCSH for that reason. Um, as to why Scott, well we found uh, it was amazing, like it, it's a really amazing resource. Um, we chose it because it was there was a sparkle endpoint, it was set for a good audience level. Um, it was multidisciplinary but it was sort of aiming at educated or educational users. Um, and it had an Australian flavour. And I'm showing you a scootle screen here as well. I hope you can see it. Um, essentially, in the scootle screen, it shows how um, in Scott, if you do a search for Oxbow Lake, which is actually a foreign, according to Australian term for a billabong, then it actually does find the items that come up that reference billabong. So it's obviously a related term or I'm not sure how it's expressed in Sparkle, but anyway, it's obviously there as a related term in that thesaurus. Unfortunately, we didn't actually get to implement the approach that Scootle's taken here in the front end or the website um, in, our information, in our search facility on the Dame site. Um, I would really like to, because I think it helps support a wider range of user discourses and it edges us closer to a semantic search approach but we had some implementation issues around the problem of how to um, perform solar search but unite that with a sparkle query looking for related terms and I think I've got a clue now as to how to do that but um that's not what we did at the time um, so let's just have a quick look at what we did do and what we implemented um, because we were looking to be multidisciplinary in our support for different start types of data. We wanted to use a linked data approach um, and we thought that was a good way of building bridges or relations between discipline contexts. So um, obviously linked data, as we heard from Les before, it relies on URIs. Um, so basically named entities should be linked via URIs. So that helps to contextualize them. And also the relationship should be described. So we were using Omeka, which is an open source digital library platform, and it's quite usable for technical novices and supports item relations. So um, on the image on the screen, you can see that it's linking, we can link named entities like people and institutions to items. But so it goes some way to providing a linked data approach, but certainly not far enough because it's not always possible to include that URI to um, identify the named entities and we needed to extend its functionality. So one thing we did was enable API connections so that we could um, connect to control vocabularies that returned URIs. Um, so here's the change that we made to the Osmeca admin. Um, we're looking at the content management system and we have an item here and we're editing the item to um, add a subject. And so, Essentially, we've made it so that the lookup can actually interrogate more than one data source and return terms based on what the data librarian has typed in. So here, the data librarian is beginning to type in salinity and they're getting um, the top terms from the list from Scott and LCSH for that, for that bit of text. Okay, so essentially behind the scenes, what we're doing here, um, well, the idea for this was that data librarians can check the subject scope while they go. Um, it also means that because the URI is returned that the um, context of the use of that term is not ambiguous. 
and um, we used a server component called Fill My List to, um, you know, basically to, it can be configured to query one or more data sources and return the URIs for the terms. So that's how we got to have more than one vocabulary, which I think, um, according to my old LIS lecturer, would have been a heresy in the old days of LIS. <laughs> and I don't know why that is. Was it because of technical inca incapacity to support more than one vocabulary for a field? Um, there are potentially problems with it. For example, we had um, arguments over which was the better term, where terms were representing essentially the same con concept. But um, I'm, I'm, still I'm still kind of open to the idea of having more than one sort of recombinant lists being added <clears throat> to one field as a vocabulary. Um, so I'm interested to hear what people think about that. Okay, one other thing I thought I'd really quickly run through. I'm sorry, I don't have, oh, I'm running out of time. We also wanted to make um, fish, the fish species information, um, something that could be semantically searched in the sense that um, fish can have many names. I mean, scientifically speaking, in terms of biological taxa, there's no such thing as a fish, and that should have warned us that fish species weren't going to be as unambiguous as we hoped, but no. We went ahead um, and we found that um, species, you know, they're obviously another named entity, so they should be amenable to linked data principles. But once again, it was challenging because fisher people, for example, or the seafood industry or indigenous people or scientists will all call the same fish species by different names. And we used ALA as our source of truth on fish species at the time. We found um, in the data that fish names also vary by geography. So for example, in the example you can see on screen, um, we discovered that what an ecologist would refer to as a golden perch, which is the preferred common name, is also known by local fishers in um, the south of the Murray-Darling Basin as callop, but known as to fishermen in the north of the Murray-Darling Basin as yellow belly. So we had to create essentially what were, were effectively local records so that the Dharma Hub could maintain it sort of like a little set of worldviews or a set of alternate names while still interoperating with um, ALA. So it essentially meant a bit of a cludge, which was adding species records to our collection. But that had other benefits. So in fact, on ALA, Golden Perch is Macquarie Ambigua, but regardless of the... Um, the name you search on, you'll return related items that mention any of the name variants. So that's just two examples of how we were trying to support um, search and also faceted search, obviously, and to some degree semantic search that would allow for different ways of um, different knowledge domains and different ways of talking about things. My questions that come out of this are, what do you think about the idea of like recombinant vocabularies, as I'm calling them? <laughs> what do you think of the possible problems? And um, the second question was, I guess, about the difference between solar search and faceted search. How do we get the two to get closer together and um, to provide semantic search capabilities? So thank you. <laughs>